Jesus himself acknowledged that even evil men do give good gifts to their children. I, did, I it acknowledged right up front that there is this thing called civic good. Men cannot have spiritual goodness, cannot choose spiritual things. And yes, we're created in the image of God, and that has not been totally destroyed by the fall in the broad sense of the term. We still have rationality. We still make choices. We're not coerced and so forth. But the point is, is that the Bible says very clearly, the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it is impossible to please him. It says in Proverbs 21:4, the plowing of the wicked is sin. And it says in Romans 14:23, whatever is not from faith is sin. You see, yes, they have outward good deeds, a plumber who is better than a, uh, an axe murderer, that's true. But these things do not please God at all. They are done from selfishness, they are done not from true faith in Christ, and therefore they are not truly virtuous. And therefore, we need Jesus Christ to regenerate our hearts, and then we can have faith in Christ, and then we can have true virtue. Now, getting back to divine election, the Bible's crystal clear that divine election is not something that man does. It's based upon God, his predestinating power. Romans 9, 11, and 13 to 15. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. But what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Okay, that's the Arminian objection. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whoever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whoever I will have compassion. In other words, I'm going to save who I want to save, and I'm going to not save who I don't want to save. Okay, God is not trying to save all men. He saves just the elect. So then, it is not him who wills. Okay, it's not a man's free will. Nor is it him who runs, I mean, it's not man's human effort, trying to do good works to please God, but it is of God who shows mercy. Divine election is shown, is completely based upon God's choice of who he wants to save. Now you say, well, that's not fair. Well, the Bible teaches that we are all dead in trespasses and sins. We have the guilt of Adam's sin, we have the pollution of Adam's sin, and we've all committed thousands of sins ourselves. We all deserve to go to hell. God did not have to save anyone. But of his own mercy, he chose a people for himself. And those people will be saved. And Christ died for those people, and they are united with him in his death, and they cannot be lost. We'll see that in a moment. Now, people will object to Romans, and they'll say, well, the word hate can sometimes mean to love less. And yes, that in, uh, Luke, that's true. When it talks about hating your parents, it does mean to love less. But does it mean to love less in this context? Well, let me tell you something. If I uh, slit your throat... If I slit the throat of your firstborn son and then drowned you in the backyard swimming pool, would you call that to love less? No, you would not. He doesn't have feet, he doesn't have ears and nostrils. Uh, God doesn't repent in the same way a man does, obviously. God does not change, he cannot change. That's basically all Arminians agree with this. His view is totally unorthodox. But let me get back to Christ's death. You know that his ministry did not end with his death on the cross and his resurrection. He also is a high priest, we're told, and he intercedes for the elect. And this is amazing. If Christ is trying to save all men, if he died for all men, why doesn't he pray for all men? Answer that question. Tell me. It says here in 1 John 2, 1, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Was Jesus an advocate for Adolf Hitler or Charles Manson? Uh, Hebrews 7, 24 to 25, he continues forever and has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. He saves to the uttermost because he didn't just die and he's not up in heaven waiting for people to choose him. He's actively interceding, praying for them. And his intercession, we're told, saves to the uttermost. And this one is John 17, 2, 9, 11, 15, 19, 20, and 24. I'm not going to read the whole, the whole thing, but let me listen to this. As you have given him authority over all flesh, then he should give eternal life to as many as you has, have given him. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Holy Father, keep them, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Father, I desire that they also, who you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may be, behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus does not pray for all men. Jesus prays for the elect, for those whom Father has given to him, 
and not one will be lost, because Christ ever lives to make intercession for them. Why did Judas go out and hang himself and go to hell? And why did Peter, after his grievous sin, repent? Well, we're told in Luke 22, 32, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fell not. That is why Peter repented and Judas did not, because Christ's intercession. And if Christ was trying to save all men, then please tell me why he is not praying for all men. There are three possibilities. Christ died for all men, but he doesn't bother to pray for all men. That would place a gross disharmony in his redemptive work. Or that Christ did not die for all men, and therefore he does not pray for all men. That's Calvinism. That makes perfect sense. Or that Christ is praying for all men, but the Father refuses to answer Christ's prayers. But we're specifically told in Hebrews chapter 7 that God does answer Christ's prayers. You can't get around that. Jesus only died for the elect, and those are the ones he saves and intercedes for immediate context of Romans chapter 9. Why did, not the, why did the nation reject Christ? Well, that tells us why. Not all Israel were true Israelites. They did not have faith in Christ. They were not elect. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that some other time. Romans 4.25. I want you to see that the passages that talk about the death of Christ, none of them talk about a hypothetical salvation. Jesus really removes the guilt of sin. He really takes people to heaven. He doesn't just make it a possibility with you contribute your own part. You see, with the Arminian view, faith is not a gift of God. Faith is something you generate in your own heart and therefore you get credit for it, and you're not saved through faith, you're saved because of faith. That is heretical. That is a damnable heresy. It says here in Romans 4.25, Jesus our Lord was delivered up because of our offenses and raised for our justification. If Jesus died for you, you will be justified. That means you're declared righteous in the heavenly court. Your sins are gone, man. You can't go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. Uh, Jesus, uh, Galatians 3.13, Paul says that Christ became a curse for us. He eliminated the curse of the law. He eliminated the penalty of the law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, if he did that, how can he go to hell? Hell's a curse. Hell's the curse for disobeying the law. Uh, Ephesians 5.25, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. For, for it. Excuse me. And then it says here in Re Revelation 5.9, You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. Christ didn't save everyone in every nation. Christ didn't die for everyone in every nation. He saved a people out of every nation. Very clear. Titus 2.14, Christ himself gave himself for us. Okay, this is all the church talking for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Well, if you're uh, redeemed from every lawless deed and you're purified by Christ, how can you go to hell? Please tell me that. Uh, Hebrews 1.13, he purged our sins. That means he got rid of all your sins. Well, if he got rid of all your sins, how can you be punished for your sins in hell? It says in uh, Hebrews 9.12, he obtained eternal redemption. Well, eternal redemption means forever, folks. Hebrews 10.14, uh, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's not a possibility of salvation. That's perfection in heaven. 1 John 1.7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Did Jesus Christ die for Adolf Hitler? Did Adolf Hitler have his all his sins cleansed by Christ? Did Joe Stalin have all his sins cleansed by Jesus Christ? Of course not. If they did, they'd be in heaven. You can't punish the same sin twice, once on the Savior and once in hell. You see, if Jesus Christ died for you and you were united with him in his death, you will have eternal life. It's very clear. Jesus died for the many, Matthew 26, 28. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Why? For the remission of sins. You see, if he died for you, your sins will be remitted and you will go to heaven. It's that clear. You cannot go to hell. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, give his life a ransom. For even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. The word bought there is the word despotin. It is always used in the New Testament of God the Father. It's never used of Jesus Christ. And this is a reference. In fact, you can look up Luke 2.29, Acts 4.24, 2 Timothy 2.21, Revelation 6.10. And here's an example from Jude 4. The only Lord, despotent God and our Lord, Curion, Jesus Christ. Curion is always used of Jesus Christ. This reference is a pa he's referring to a passage uh, in Exodus. And it's very clear that it's used of God the Father. It is not talking about the blood of Christ. It's talking about a temporal deliverance. And this harkens back, excuse me, to Deuteronomy 32, 6. Thus, O foolish and unwise people, he's not your father who bought you. Has he not made you and established you? It's talking about their deliverance from Egypt. It's not talking about the bloody sacrifice of Christ.
and I could go on and show that that has nothing to do with the death of Jesus Christ. So that's just not a good proof text for that. First of all, he keeps assuming that Calvinists believe that God is not active. We do believe God is very active, but that which is perfect cannot change. God is, does not change in his essential nature. God is very active in creation. God does use secondary means. Men are responsible for their actions. We do not teach that men are robots. We do not have a Muslim view of God. We teach that God is very active. But the Bible is crystal clear. Okay, when he talked about us limiting the death of Christ, the Arminians and Calvinists limit the death of Christ in two different ways. We believe that the death of Christ is sufficient to save all men in a thousand planets. He was God and man. So we do not limit it in power. We limit in its plan and extent. God did not have Jesus shed his blood for those in hell. Were the people burning in hell when Christ died? Did he shed his blood for them also who could not believe? Okay. The Arminian limits Christ's power, his blood, his power to save. It doesn't actually save anyone unless they exercise their free will. So you have a very, very two different views. They limit the uh, power to save, and we limit the extent of the plan of his death. Okay? They don't teach that Christ's death actually saves anyone. All it does is it renders salvation a possibility if men contribute their own good works to it, which is just a, a heresy. It's like Romanism. You have to contribute your act of the will. When we just saw in John chapter 1, it is not of the will of the flesh, it's nor the blood, but of God. And the but is emphatic. Romans, it is not him who wills or him who runs, but God who shows mercy. You know, the Bible is very clear. God has mercy on some, and others he passes by and he hardens. And I don't know how you can get around that. There's just no way. And let's get back to a few other passages. Uh, 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 it says here in Matthew 18, 14, But even is not the will of your Father who is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Not one will perish.